Mary Ann Haruska, and I'm a board member of the Library Foundation. We'd like to thank our major sponsors, Broadway Plaza, Minuteman Press, and the Contra Costa Times. It's annual giving time for the Foundation. Have you been getting letters in your mailbox from all those organizations who know your name? Well, ours will be coming shortly. But I would like to tell you that your gifts support collections for children, adults, fiction, nonfiction, uh, DVDs, <coughs> magazines, you name it. Do you remember some years ago people said libraries were dying? Well, I can tell you that the collections at this library fly out the door and the number of people who come in grows every month. So we certainly don't see that and we need our annual giving fund in order to buy more books. We also supported the children's summer program this last year. We had over 2,000 youngsters in Walnut Creek enrolled. We support a, a variety of local of programming at the two libraries. Not, not programs that we do, programs the library does, but we provide funding and other help for them. Plus equipment and other needs. This live program is a library foundation program. We plan them, we come up with the ideas, we're the volunteers, we do them. It's the second year here in this room in our new library and it is, it's fantastic. These programs are all free and they're supported by annual giving. So after 12 years of significant financial help to the libraries, you know, you'd think that we maybe had done all we can do, but we keep seeing new things that can be done. And thanks to these facilities, there's, there are always ideas of things we can do. So my advice to you when that envelope comes in the next 10 days or so, is to give early and give often. <laughs> so tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Sanderson. Eric grew up in Walnut Creek and graduated from Las Lomas High School. His mother and I have been best friends for, well, over 40 years now. So I've known Eric a long time. He got his PhD in ecology from UC Davis in 1998. Then he was hired by the Wildlife Conservation Society at the Bronx Zoo in New York. So this California boy went east. WCS wanted him for his academic emphasis on the ecosystem and landscape ecology, which I think at the time was a relatively new term. Is that not correct? This isn't the landscape around our houses. This is the Earth's landscape. At WCS, he established the Landscape Ecology and Geographic Analysis Program to bring landscape thinking and geographic analysis tools into their conservation practices. Within four years, he and his colleagues had created the Human Footprint Map. They looked at human influence globally and brought it down to less than one square mile so that, I mean, like, like your Google map, you can, you can drill down into this and find out what kind of human, not what kind, but how much in human influence there was. You can go, in fact, to the Human Footprint website, I think it is, and there are specific topics you can look at and get more specific information. He also travels around the world as an expert on species conservation planning from tigers to tapers to crocodiles, and from Mongolia to Argentina to Yellowstone Park. He directs the Manahatta Project, which is what we're gonna hear about tonight. And that's been an effort to reconstruct the original ecology of Manhattan Island as it would have looked when Henry Hudson set foot there 400 years ago. Well, is it 402 now? <laughs> anyway, or three. <laughs> Their website, waylikia.org, has curriculum materials, and from my looking at it, it uh, teachers anywhere can take these materials and adapt them to their own areas. Tonight, he's also invited Robin Grossinger of the San Francisco Estuary Institute to join him and to give us a snapshot of the historical ecology of Contra Costa County, a similar study that is peeling back the layers of human change to the environment. We'll go away with a better feel for how we interact with our landscape and how we can use that knowledge to better plan the human future. So please welcome Dr. Eric Sanderson.
Thanks so much, Marianne. That was, that was really great. And it's, it's so terrific to see so many people here and so many old friends and neighbors and family members. And so it's, it's very gratifying because it's been a long journey since I, I lived in Walnut Creek. And I'd like to, to take you into one piece of that journey. And that's to discover um, this place, which is uh, Manhattan Island, and to try and see it in a new light, to, to try and see it as if we could go into a time machine and back 400 years to September 12th, 1609, um, when Henry Hudson sailed into New York Harbor and saw this island, which is Manahata, which means island of many hills. And so what I'd like to tell you for the next 45 minutes or so, thank you, um, is how we come to know this island, um, what we think it, and, and what we think it means about our relationship to nature writ large, and particularly in cities, and how it's a way of rethinking what, uh, what life in New York City, and by extension other cities around the world, can mean. And then I'm really fortunate that Robin's here to try and bring the same kind of story and same kind of approach home to, home to the landscape where you live. So we call our project the Manahata Project, and uh, we're thinking deliberately of the Manhattan Project, uh, when we call it that. That's <laughs> right. You know, the Manhattan Project also started on Manhattan. Um, but whereas the Manhattan Project aimed to actually blow up cities, um, <laughs> we're only interested in blowing up this old idea of cities, this old idea that cities and nature are opposite to each, to each other and that they don't have anything to do with each other. So I have a story in three acts with a little epilogue at the end. Um, and act one is called A Map Found. And uh, it actually starts out here. So I was, I was very lucky when I was at Las Lomas down the street. Um, I spent a lot of time as a Boy Scout and uh, with Bob Campbell, who was a biology teacher at Las Lomas, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, taking, um, taking pictures and, and having experiences like you see here. And, um, and spending time in the Red Rock Canyons of the Southwest and in the forests of Colorado. And, and very early on in my childhood, sort of the love of landscape got imprinted on me. And so when it finally became time for me to do my graduate studies, I was interested in this, this new field of landscape ecology that Marianne mentioned. It's all about how we see the ecosystems and their arrangement with each other. So if we look at that, that image in the Sierra Nevadas there on the left, that stream is an ecosystem, and the meadow is an ecosystem, and the forest is an ecosystem, and somehow the configuration of them together makes habitat for plants and animals, including for people. And that's true in the Sierra Nevadas, and that's true in, in the Red Rock Canyons, and it's actually true everywhere in the world. And uh, so this kind of thinking, um, kind of to my surprise, got me a job at the Bronx Zoo in New York, um, which was founded 100 years ago as part of the New York Zoological Society. And nowadays, we call ourselves the Wildlife Conservation Society. And it was founded because uh, rich, wealthy East Coast conservationists like Teddy Roosevelt and his friends here uh, founded the society um, because they were worried about what was happening to the world, about the, the number of people and the industrialization and, and the domestication of the planet. And so they founded this institution to try and connect people to nature in New York City through zoos and then to save animals and save places out in the wild. And we've been true to that mission ever since. Um, and it's, it's, in some ways it's a nice, a nice coming around because, of course, Teddy Roosevelt had set aside many of those places that I'd learned to love, even out here. Um, but my work at the zoo isn't about the animals in the zoo, it's about the animals in the wild. So jaguars and spectacled bears and rhinos and tigers and flamingos and whale sharks and all kinds of crazy species. And so, um, so if you imagine I moved you know, from Northern California, from Davis at the time, uh, to the Bronx, New York, and that was a big change. And then I would get, you know, for work, I would get on an airplane and they would fly me to Zambia or fly me to Sarawak or f fly me all over the world to, to work with the people at the end of the road trying to save these animals. Um, and then I would get back on the airplane and come back to New York. Um, and I would go down on my weekends to Manhattan and up in the Empire State Building where I took this snapshot in, um, in 1999 and look out across this landscape this landscape of ecosystems, but now the, the buildings are ecosystems, and the streets are ecosystems, and, and there's even a park or two, and they're ecosystems. And I thought, well, if these are ecosystems, they make a landscape, and that landscape makes habitat for plants and animals, including for people, including for me, at least theoretically it makes habitat for me. But how do I fit into this, this place? And you can go to Times Square, and you can take pictures of the pretty ladies on the wall. Um, 
And you, but you can't help but frame a picture and, and you get Father Duffy right in the middle of it, you know, that, that guy on the statue. So Father Duffy he was a, a priest and he was very important for founding and creating the Times Square that we know today. But nobody in New York remembers anything about Father Duffy, even though he's standing that right there in the middle of Times Square. And it's this odd thing about New York that it's always kind of about its future and doesn't have much of a sense of its past. Um, even though there's signs of the past everywhere. So if you go to Central Park, you'll see these, these stony rock outcrops, some of which are Cambrian era rock formations. They're a billion years old. They're older than life on Earth, than the evolution of life. And they're sticking up out of the ground in Central Park. You can even see some of the original rolling topography of Mauna Hatta, the island of many hills. And yet beyond 59th Street there, what do you see but these strange, cliffy, weird hills that are so unlike anything else you ever see in nature. Um, it's what landscape ecologists call a hard edge. So I started reading about the history and the geography of, of New York as a way of kind of trying to get used to the place. And I read that New York City was the first mega city on the face of the planet, a, a city of 10 million people or more. And there had never been 10 million people in one place ever in the history of humanity until 1950. And that one place was New York City. Today there's between 18 and 22 mega cities like this around the world and it's predicted we might have another 10 over the next 10 to 15 years. You know, uh, the, the trend toward urbanization, which you also see here in, in this part of the world, um, is the number one land use trend of the 20th century and it's predicted to be the number one land use trend of the 21st century. There are, there are literally more people living in cities today than there were people in the world in 1900. Just to give you a, a sense of the scale of this transformation. So, so it struck me then that the history of New York, you know, both the, the pains of being a very large city as well as the pleasures could be very important for this new way of living uh, for people on, on planet Earth. Um, so one of, the, one of the pleasures of doing this reading is you sometimes find paintings like this. This painting's in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York, and it shows um, the beach that was at 125th Street and the West Side Highway on the west side of Manhattan. I don't know how many of you know New York. There's a, there's a famous market there, the Fairway Market that everybody stops at um, in Harlem. Um, this painting's from the 1840s, and it's by Victor Gifford Audubon, John James Audubon's son. And that's actually John James sitting on the rock there, watching the men bring in striped bass and American shad out of the river. You, if you zoom in, you can actually identify the fish. And we're looking to the north, and you can see the forested heights of Washington Heights, and that point of land there is where the George Washington Bridge goes across the Hudson River today into New Jersey. And I thought, you know, in all the amazing things that we say and think about New York, how come we never talk at all about the beaches, or the forest, or, or the rocks, or the fish, or the river? Because these are such, these are also part of what it means to be living in New York. Uh, you could go further back in time. This is an engraving from the 1760s, so, so before the American Revolution. And these are two students from King's College, later Columbia University, sitting on a hill overlooking a valley in Greenwich Village. Um, and we're looking just north of the city, so we're looking south, and you can see Staten Island in the distance there. And I would, you know, literally go on my weekend to try and find this hill and find that valley and find that silly-looking palm tree. Uh, turns out the palm tree was added by an engraver back in England because he thought the landscape was so boring that it needed something else and so it's America so it has to have a palm tree. Um, so it was in the course of this, um, this work that I ran into a map that I want to show you um, because it turned out this was the, the sort of point which, which led the project to take on a, a different tone. Um, this is a map from the American Revolution made by the British military when they were occupying New York City. So just to just say briefly about New York uh, revolutionary history. Um, in 1775, we have Boston and Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. But in 1776, the, the, the main theater of war shifted to the New York City region. So at the same time the Founding Fathers are writing the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, George Washington's in New York fighting the British, and the British landed 21,000 troops that summer to try and take New York City and to try and extinguish Washington's army and end the war quickly. And they, they almost succeeded. They, uh, Washington set up on, on Brooklyn Heights or on, on the Moraine in Brooklyn, and the English turned his line and he had to retreat, first to Brooklyn Heights, which you see here where it says Brooklyn Ferry right here, and then across to Manhattan. And this was the extent of New York City as it was at that time. 
And then Washington fled north, and there were several battles. And eventually, Washington lost Manhattan, lost the New York City region. And it was lost until the very end of the war. But he, he managed to keep his army, and so was able to continue fighting on. And the British made this their capital. It made their, their British headquarters. So all the men and all the materiel were coming into the great deep water harbor of New York City. And all the loyalists were coming. The city swelled from 20,000 people to 40,000 people. And the British Army was doing everything it could to try and hold on to this city. So they, they had um, fortifications like you see here. They're building star forts. They're, um, they're marching people up and down. There are big fleets in the harbor. And they're making maps, because maps are very important to military strategy. And this is sort of the culmination of their efforts, which in its original form, which is in the National Archives in London, is 10 feet long and 3 and a half feet wide and 6 inches to a mile scale. Um, it's quite an extraordinary map, and I'm, I'm just going to take you for a little walk up the map so, so you, can, you can actually see what a great map it is. Um, so if you know New York, this is, this is Bowling Green, and the Customs House um, is right here today. That's where the old fort is. So, so that means where it says Town of New York here. Can you see that? That's Broadway. So that makes this Wall Street, or that's Trinity Church, and here's Wall Street right here. So that's where the protesters are, right? It's a Cotty Park. Um, uh, well, the park wasn't on this map at the time. Yeah, <laughs> that came a little later. Um, so you can continue walking north, and this triangle of land, that's City Hall Park. So that's where the, the mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, has his office today. <laughs> and uh, that was essentially the extent of New York City in 1782 or 1783. That's when this map was made. So you could walk 20 minutes and be at the edge of the city. Um, but what really struck me about this map is what you see north of the city, like uh, this thing. This is a pond. This is the, the collect pond which was the fresh water source for New York for its first 200 years. You know, you can't drink the East River over here or the Hudson River because they're part of an estuary, they're salty. So you need to get fresh water from somewhere and, and they got it from this pond which was 70 feet deep and fed by underwater springs. Later the city built right over the top of it which then led eventually to the aqueduct system to bring water and our, our current water system which brings water 125 miles from the Catskill. Delaware watershed. But it all started here with the collect pond. Um, these are salt marshes here, the Lisbonard marshes. This canal was later enlarged when they drained the collect pond, and that become, became the canal for Canal Street, which is in Chinatown today. Um, you see hills. This map was actually made before they invented contour lines, but they would draw the hills with these hatchers. Those are these, those hills we saw in that engraving before. These are streams. This is Mineta water winding through Greenwich Village. Um, this are the sand hills that came up through Astor Place and uh, Union Square. Um, this, little, this little crook here in the stream had a, a swamp associated with it, and the, the Dutch called it Krom Ragashi, which means little crooked swamp, but the uh, British couldn't say that any more than I can say it, and so they called it uh, Gramercy, and that became Gramercy Park, which uh, if you know your New York City history knows, became a very, very fancy neighborhood later on. Um, this is the Sunfish Pond. And this is Murray Hill. This is actually the Murray's house on Murray Hill. Murray Hill is just a neighborhood today. There's not much of a hill there anymore. Uh, here's Kipps Bay and Turtle Bay where the United Nations is. Um, over here is, uh, let me zoom in again. This is uh, Times Square, circa 1782. <laughs> a dusty country road crossing two streams with uh, remnants of beaver ponds that form this uh, larger stream called the Great Kill, which uh, if you read about brook trout fishing in America, you'll find out that the people used to fish in colonial times for sea run brook trout in the Great Kill and, and hunt for ducks down here in this uh, salt marsh about 42nd Street. Anyway, so I, there's lots and lots of stories to tell about this map, but I just want to show you what a remarkable insight it is into the landscape that we don't have anymore, right? You know, streams, hills, beaches, wetlands, these are not usually words associated with New York City. Um, and so it struck me that I, maybe I could use some of the techniques we use at work in wildlife conservation and landscape ecology to georeference this map, to, to lay the streets on and the, the buildings um, and the parks so that we could actually see um, where these features are in the geography of the city that we know today. And if you zoom in down here to the collect pond, you see it there, and I can, I can then trace the collect pond and the streams that used to go into it. And you, do you see this building here that's uh, like a hexagon? 
This is the New York City courthouse. This is the courthouse at the beginning of uh, Law and Order when the lawyers are walking up the steps. So what this means is the lawyers could have walked right down the steps and into the clock pond 400 years ago. <laughs> so sometimes I take kids and we, um, we, uh, we navigate. You can put the cursor over here and these, these numbers, which are a little bit blurry, but these are the GPS coordinates or what your, you know, your car knows about. So you can then, you know, I'll, I'll get kids and they'll write those numbers down and then we'll take a, a handheld GPS and then we'll walk right to the middle of the clock pond and then I'll ask them to close their eyes and close their ears and imagine they're you know, paddling in a dugout canoe and maybe there's an osprey there and there's a little amphitheater of round hills covered with forest and a Native American village at the southern edge. Of course, those things aren't there anymore. Um, so let me take away the buildings, <coughs> streets, parks. Something else um, that's fun about this is that you can, you can see where the old shoreline is. So that blue line is the 1609 shoreline and uh, here's the modern shoreline. Right, so you can see that there was a lot of fill actually in the colonial times. So the original shoreline was along the line of what's now Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. And it was called Pearl Street because there were shells from Native Americans, clams and oyster shells. Some of them repeatedly dinner sized plate oysters that were taken right out of New York Harbor that were um, some of the food that people ate. Um, the, the city so valued being compact that instead of expanding north, they would actually sell water lots. You could actually buy the water between the high tide and the low tide off the shore of Manhattan, and then you would fill it in, and then you could build a wharf and make a lot of money for yourself. And so there were several rounds of this. You can see um, Pearl Street, and then this next street out is Water Street, right? Originally the edge of the water, and the next street out there is Front Street, and then eventually we have the FDR Highway, which comes around. Um, let me take this away. So, so this is fun. When um, uh, Nick Palmgarten wrote a, a piece in The New Yorker about the project, and he said this is sort of a, a naturalist version of George Washington slept here, right? Like, <laughs> oh, there's a stream under my building, or I'm living where a hill used to be. Um, but, uh, but I thought maybe the map would tell us more than that. Um, and to do that, you know, we had to think about it as a landscape ecologist might. And that meant to, to take the map and and recognize how it shapes the ecological boundaries of the landscape, right? So it, it tells us the shoreline, right? Which is a very important ecological boundary between marine waters and being on land. You know, that's a big difference. It tells us about the hydrology, right? Where the water is, and that's very important for the wetlands and the kind of species, the plant species that grow there. The topography tells us about how the sun interacts with the landscape and how the soils form. And so if we could just add some more information to the map, um, maybe we could build up the landscape, and not just build up the landscape in 1782 when the map was drawn, but actually go through the map back in time, back to 1609. So, so we started doing that. We started collecting maps about the, the bedrock geology of Manhattan and the, the superficial geology. This is what the glaciers left. Um, we used those to drive a soils map um, that's reflecting the, geog the geology and the topography and the, the hydrology and the vegetation. We, we spent a long time working on this map, which is a map of the topography in the computer. It's called a digital elevation model. And with this, you can, um, you can touch the map anywhere and find the elevation. So that Bayard's Mount was 110 feet high, and Jones Hill over here was 71 feet high, and it was 37 feet high in between. And then once you have this map, then you can ask the computer to show you the slopes, where the, the darker colors are the steeper slopes, and the aspects, which way the slopes face, which has to do with the way the sun is. You can blow a winter wind across the map and uh, see where the protected areas. This is, uh, imagine a northerly wind, so um, the white areas are more protected. And that was important, that's important for knowing about the way trees fall, but it's also important for knowing about how human beings might have used this landscape. And those human beings were the Lenape, the Delaware people, the, the original New Yorkers, if you like, the, the culture that was there before Henry Hudson. And we gathered all the information we could about the archaeology of those people, and then we built um, this, this map, which is a, a probability map of where they might have used the island, um, reflecting distance from salt water where they could fish, and, and distance from fresh water where they could drink the water, and flat, flat areas with good soils and protected from the winter wind. And you can see how the the cluck pond here was actually a pretty, pretty darn good place to live. Um, and in fact, that does match the archaeology and the history. Um, so let me check off some of these maps. Um, and we know that around the southern edge of the cluck pond here, there was a Native American camp, um, a Lenape camp. 
and, um, and that these people practiced a kind of horticulture where they would grow these gardens of corn, bean, and squash. Um, so we can't know where those gardens were exactly, but we can simulate them using the computer and using some, some ideas about, about the archaeology and the way they used the land. And so they would, they would grow these gardens and we fitted them to be the size that's appropriate for the village nearby. Um, and the interesting thing is that these, these fields couldn't last um, forever by themselves because they didn't have a way to continue adding fertilizer on their own. So after 20 or 25 years, they would abandon them and they would become old fields. And old fields, you know, you would think that that's, you know, that's just abandoned land. But in fact, in an ecosystem context, they were a grassland. And, and grasslands were very important in, in the Northeast forest. Most of Manahata was covered with forest, but these were grasslands for grassland animals and plants. Um, and they would eventually fill in with shrubs after another 80 years. And then those shrubs would eventually fill in after 200 years and make forest. And in this way, we were able to incorporate the sort of physical aspects of the environment, the geology and the soils and the topography with the disturbance from what people were doing in this case and, and make a map of the 55 ecological communities that once lived on Manahata. And so I, I don't know how much that means to you, 55 different ecosystem types, but, but to an ecologist, it's quite a, quite, a, quite a large number for such a small area. If you look at the vegetation map for Yellowstone National Park, it has, it has 63 types for an area that's 2.2 million acres. And we have 55 types for an area that's one-tenth of one percent of that, that same area. Um, and it has to do with the unique biogeography of, of Manhattan, its place at the end of the last glaciation, its place in the, in the estuary, um, its biogeography, it's sort of at the edge of the, the southern flora and the beginning of the northern flora. It's, it's on the flyway for birds and for fish. It's, it turns out that it had a very extraordinary uh, biodiversity, and I probably don't, you probably understand that if it has many different habitat types, then that means it can have many different species as well, and can have a high population diversity as well, a high diversity of species. Um, and so, so sometimes I say, and this is a little bit of hyperbole, but imagine if California had been settled first, and then you know, America had worked its way across the country from west to east, and we got to Manhattan, and we said, well, you know, maybe we should set aside some land for, for nature instead of building up the whole thing. Then maybe they would have set aside Manahata, and we would have Manahata National Park. <laughs> and uh, people would fly from all over the world to go to Manahata to see you know, all the plants and all the animals and to see all the different ecosystem types. Uh, but, uh -huh. but it didn't work out quite that way. Um, but I can show you what some of these ecosystems look like in Act Two, um, because if you go within 75 miles of the city, you can see examples of these ecosystems that have been conserved in parks and preserves. Um, Hemlock Northern Hardwood Forest or Hempstead Plains. There was a large grassland where Harlem is that was probably maintained by Native American burning. Um, this is what the Collect Pond might have looked like 400 years ago. Um, this is what the forest on the hills might have looked like. There were 66 miles of streams on Manhattan, another 22 miles of ephemeral streams, something like 300 springs were once on Manhattan Island, uh, all a reflection of our generally aquatic climate. We get about four inches of rain every month, month in and out during the course of the year, and, and the fact that the glaciers had these, left these sandy beds that allowed the water to flow through. About 25% of the island was originally salt marshes, and these are our east coast salt marshes as opposed to our West Coast salt marshes out here, um, with this, um, which like once here had this very distinct zonation of high and low, and then these mud flats, and then the deeper water on beyond. Um, there were seven different kinds of forest types. This picture is actually from Manhattan Island, believe it or not. Up at the very northern tip of the island, there's a park called Inwood Hill Park, which was very <coughs> steep. The topography was very steep. It was never completely built over. And you can still see trees that are 200 or 300 years old there. Uh, this is what Times Square might have looked like 400 years ago. Beautiful, uh, beautiful red maple swamp. Home to wood ducks and black bears and other such things. Uh, there are sandy beaches on the Hudson River shore from, from the tip of the island all the way up to 42nd Street and in pockets uh, uh, further north and on the East River side. And of course there were the ecosystems that people made, um, including wigwams and, and uh, longhouses and trails. This is a wigwam that my son, who you can see pictured here, and I and a friend built in the New York Botanical Garden. 
So which uh, just reminds me to say that it's really important when we think about Manahata, when we think about North America before Europeans, that we don't forget that there were people there already and that those people were, um, had lives. There, the evidence for New York City is that there was human occupation for 8,000 years before Henry Hudson shows up. But we don't remember much about them because they didn't write anything down. And these people lost out really early in the, in the settlement. By 1679, most of the Native Americans had left uh, Manhattan. Uh, these are the Lenape, the ancient ones of Algonquin culture. They told the story about Turtle Island that, that we, we remember today, Gary Snow remembers. They, um, they were also called the Delaware people later in their history. And they, they were kicked out and given land in the Ohio River Valley and eventually ended up in, in Oklahoma where they are today. But back then, they had a really great life on Manhattan. They lived in small groups. They had lots to eat. Um, Lots of nuts and, and fish, of course, great fish runs up the rivers, um, shells. They made wampum like you see here, which, uh, which wasn't a money until the Dutch came and said, oh, you could use that for money. They didn't have an idea about money. What they had was an idea of marking respect for each other. They, um, they moved a lot during the course, of, uh, the course of the year. They didn't have just one place like we do to live. They would you know, live by the rivers when the fish were running, and they would move to a different place when it was time to grow their crops, and then they would move someplace else during the winter time. And so, you know, you can imagine if you, you know, there's, not, there's no point to have 30 deerskin cloaks if you're gonna have to carry them on your back three times a year, right? Um, you know, they didn't have a way to accumulate stuff. So what they did was they would share the things they had. Um, and, uh, yeah. and, and the other thing to say about them is that they lived at very low density compared to what we're used to. So we think there were maybe 300 to 600 people living on Manhattan 400 years ago. And there's something like 1.6 million people living on Manhattan today. So you can see 300 people walk by a block on Fifth Avenue at lunchtime in about five minutes, and that would have been the entire population. So, but I like to talk about the Lenape because they lived in the New York City environment. They lived where the big buildings are today. And so they, they become a connection to the way that people are living there today still. Um, they grew their own food for the most part. Um, they got about 25% of their calories from food that they grew, and they grew these gardens of corn, beans, and squash, which were grown all across North America at this time. Um, and it's a really smart way to grow, grow your food. You could do it here in California. They, you make a mound in the springtime, and you plant corn in the top. And then the, as the corn grows up, then you plant, climb, you plant beans around it, and the beans are climbing beans. And so they climb on the corn and use the corn like a scaffold to get the sun. At the same time, the beans are feeding nitrogen into the roots of the corn. Um, so, that, so that it's a symbiosis, it's a deliberate symbiosis that was, that was discovered and, and it's very, very productive. Um, these fields can be as productive as the Iowa corn fields, except that you can't harvest them with a tractor. Um, and then between the mounds at the bottom, it's a little hard to see, but you could plant uh, squash. And squash have these real big leaves and they keep the, the soil in, and they keep the water in, and they keep the weeds down. So I've been growing this garden for about eight years in, in the New York Botanical Garden near our wigwam. And, uh, and it's really great. You, if you keep the weeds out till the end of June, then it just goes by itself. The main thing is you have to keep the animals out, which I've learned with, uh, quite bitterly, actually. Um, and the Lenape would have done it by having their kids sleep in the field overnight. <laughs> but they won't let me do that with my son, so. <laughs> so this is, a, this is just the modeling we did to try and show the effects of of beans, that, that bottom line there is, um, is the corn productivity over a 200 year period. And you can see without any beans, you hardly get anything. But if you had a little bit of beans, you get that next line. And if you had a lot of beans, you get that blue line at the top. So you get much, much higher productivity by using a natural fertilizer, a nitrogen fixing fertilizer. So uh, the point of uh, this part of the story is that there were and that they created campsites and active fields and that those created old fields and then shrublands. Um, but there weren't so many people that they completely um, overwhelmed the landscape. The landscape still had tulip tree forests and oak hickory forests and oak pine forests and beaches and smalt marshes and eelgrass meadows. And these were their neighborhoods, the same way that a modern New Yorker might know the Upper East Side or Tribeca or Inwood. You know, these people knew these neighborhoods just as intimately and where you could get your food and what was the best way to move through them and, and what, what kind of friends you could find there. And there were lots of friends. Um, there were chicken mushrooms and 600 species of flowers and shrubs and trees. 
um, 85 different species of uh, marine fishes and anadromous fishes that go back and forth and, and freshwater fishes. Uh, there were 350 species of bird. This is one of the few ones we don't have anymore. It's the heath hen, which is a grassland specialist that went extinct in the 1920s. Um, but most of the birds you can still see in Central Park today. We had beavers on all the freshwater streams and uh, wolves. There were wolves on Manhattan until the 1720s. There was a black bear shot in Maiden Lane down the lower Manhattan in the 1630s. Um, there was, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually wrote a uh, history of New York and he writes about the, the Dutch tree and the mountain lion on the Upper East Side in the 1670s. Um, there were whales and porpoises in the harbor, occasionally sea turtles. I mean, a really remarkable flora and fauna. Um, which we did a lot of work to try and summarize based on historical surveys. And what I want to point out to you is that um, of the likely species, there were 1,001 different vertebrate animals and plants. And we were interested in what connects these species to each other and to the environment. So, so on the one hand, you have all these species. On the other hand, you have all these maps describing the landscape. How can you put them together? And to do that, we used habitat descriptions that describe the food and water and shelter and reproductive requirements of a species. And if you like, you can think of that, this is a Venn diagram where the combination of where you can get your food and your water and your shelter and what you need to raise the kids, that's your habitat or your home, if you like, right? Home is where you get everything you need, which I'm always reminded when I come back to Walnut Creek. Um, so for each species that was on our list, we looked up its habitat description. So beavers need a slowly meandering stream with aspen trees and alders and willows near the water. And uh, working with some colleagues at the American Museum of Natural History, we just started making lists of these things. So beavers need streams and aspens and alders and willows and bog turtles maybe need wet meadows and insects and sunny places. And bobcats need rabbits and beavers and den sites. Um, and along the way, you know, you see that well, beavers are something that bobcats need, but beavers are also something we're interested in, in for their own sake, for their own right. And in fact, this, this sort of simple fact, the simple ecological fact, means that these otherwise separate habitat descriptions are actually connected together. They're connected together into a network. And they're not all connected together everywhere, but they're connected in specific ways that we can, that we can understand and we can elucidate. Moreover, we can take our list and say, well, if aspen's up here, what does an aspen need? and then you can look up what an aspen needs. Or what does a wet meadow need, right? Not that a wet meadow has habitat per se, but it has conditionalities, it has dependencies that we can know. Maybe it needs beavers and other things. What does a sunny place need, or a fire need, or what do dry soils need? And in this way, we can start, we can start with the species and we can sort of work back through the, through the ecosystem to all its components. And if you do this, and it took us about two and a half years to do this, um, you get a table like this that has 1,600 elements across the top and 1,600 elements down into the, the first floor, right? It's a large, sparsely filled matrix that to a network scientist looks just like what Facebook knows about you, right? <laughs> if those were you and all your friends, right, and you and all your friends across the top, then this would be the pattern of your okay. friends, right? Or, or Google, this is what Google knows about the way the internet is structured or this is the way the power grid is structured, or this is the way terrorist networks are structured. And so, you know, as, as you can suggest, just as those examples suggest, there's a lot of people thinking about these networks, sociologists, um, computer scientists, mathematicians, terrorism experts. Everybody wants to know what makes networks strong and where they can be attacked and taken apart. And ecologists have been studying food webs for a long time, but this, takes the food web concept sort of the next level because it includes the abiotic parts of the environment. It includes the water and the shelter and reproductive requirements as well. Um, so it also means that these, there are these great tools for visualizing these networks. So, so this network can, be, can look like this or it can look like this. So on this diagram, each point is a different plant or animal or ecosystem type or stream type or soil type and each gray line is a representation of a separate individual habitat connection between that, that node and something else that it needs. And if we zoom out, it looks like this. So we call this the Manahata mirror web. And this is a representation of all the habitat connections of all the species that we think lived on Manhattan 400 years ago. 
that, that sort of ball in the middle, that represents the terrestrial species, the, the species that live on land. And then that cluster up there on the left, that's the aquatic.
Yeah, yeah, I did have to learn new computer skills when we were doing this. Um, but I also worked with a lot of smart people that have much better computer skills than I do. Um, and also much better design skills. So, so the idea here is that you can zoom into any block in Manhattan and eventually it'll load 1609. But you can click on any block and it'll bring up a representation of the species that used to live in that block. Maybe I'll go back to the, the PowerPoint version of this. So here's the, here's the same, same idea. All right, so you can zoom in on Manhattan and you can click on, you, you, it'll show you 1609 and there's a slider bar at the bottom and you can actually slide off 1609 or slide it back on. Um, you can turn on the streets, you can put in your favorite restaurant address or the place where your cousin lives or whatever you like. And then you can click on that block and then it'll bring up a, a picture of what that block used to look like 400 years ago and a list of, of all the plants and animals that used to live there, the mammals and the birds and the reptiles and the amphibians. And then if you click on the common name, it'll actually take you to a representation of the mirror web and you can see where each of those species fits into the ecological network. So we use this, this information in the third part of the project to actually visualize the landscape. So to take the tools that Hollywood uses to, to make you know, crazy made up places and to reconstruct what Third Avenue looked like 400 years ago. So my friend and colleague, Mark Boyer, helped me with this work. And I gave Mark the digital elevation model we had, and then he filled it in with the soils and the waters and gave it illumination. And then we laid on top of that the map of the different ecosystem types, and then filled in those ecosystems with little 3D models of all the plants and animals that lived in those ecosystems. And what's different about this from, um, from what you see in Lord of the Rings or Avatar or whatever the movie in the Cineplex is today is that, is that this is a real place. This is the view from Times Square 400 years ago looking to the west. Um, we can literally take a picture out of any window in Manhattan and reconstruct exactly what that view looked like 400 years ago. So we can paddle up the East River and look up at Murray Hill and see the place where the United Nations is today. and. Uh, and realize that there's 15 different ecosystem types in this view of the salt marshes and the brackish marshes and the different forest types and that there are wolves and bald eagles and sea turtles and all kinds of other species that live in this, this same landscape where the big buildings are today. We can, uh, we can fly like a hawk on the fall migration down the Hudson River and we see Manahata there on the left and New Jersey on the right and we can actually understand that Manahato, um, although in some ways it was contained, it was also connected to the wider world, connected to the, to the river, of course, and the estuary, but also by the Atlantic Flyway for birds and the fish migrations and the climate flowing across, uh, across the continent, all the way from California to New York. And it's actually a, a place that's connected to the wider world. We can even imagine Henry Hudson's ship, the half moon, on the day after September 12, 1609, perhaps moored off of 42nd Street. And maybe Hudson's you know, trying to catch a glimpse of that turtle, uh, that beaver pond at, the, at Times Square. And maybe one of his men shoots a musket and a flock of a thousand passenger pigeons flies up into the dawn light. Um, and, and realize that you know, Henry Hudson, of course, didn't appreciate what he saw. Henry Hudson was trying to get to China as fast as possible. <laughs> you know, he wanted to get rich and get to China, um, which is kind of unfortunate because the wealth of the mirror webs and the wealth of the species and the interactions, the stability and resilience of nature that he was seeing right before him is something that we're chasing after everywhere in the world today. You know, we, we, we've, we've lost this kind of resilience that was, was, was plain and obvious for people back then um, if they could only have seen it. We can even go down to the Cluck Pond again and see the smoke rising from the Native American villages and see the, the fields and the old fields and the different forest types and the wetlands and the beach and the Hudson River back beyond. And we can see that in the context of the city today. Because of course it's changed a little bit. <laughs> um, so you know, when I, when I started this project 10 years ago, I knew I loved the thing on the left, the, the, the nature part. I love this idea of walking out in the woods 
and knowing that there was this crazy cast of characters, you know, all these different species that somehow managed to live and get what they needed from each other in the same place. And that was what made the forest or the marsh or the, or the, or the water. And uh, now when I walk in Manhattan, I feel exactly the same way. You know, I walk down 42nd Street and I think, how are these crazy cast of characters, all these crazy people living together <laughs> in New York City? And they all want so many different things and yet somehow they make it work. Um, that's what I love about New York City. Um, and I think they make it work because there is the equivalent mirror web of the city, right? That resilient network of connections, some of which are our personal immediate connections, our friends and our <coughs> colleagues and our people that we share interests with. But there's also this network of connections that we, don't, we often don't recognize that goes far beyond us, that the people are making sure the food comes and the power comes and that sort of thing. And that's, you know, that's the same way that nature works, right? There's the first order and then there's the, the sort of supporting cast of characters. And from any particular node, you can look at it if that's the center and then look out from it. And human, you know, humanity for, well, for most of Western civilization has been looking at the network from only one perspective, and that's our perspective. But finally, finally after 4,000 years or 10,000 years, however you want to measure civilization, we can start to see our connections with these other things. We can actually maybe even see their perspective on the world. And I think that's really important because Manahata has something to teach us about sustainability and resilience. You know, if Henry Hudson hadn't shown up on September 12, 1609, you know, Manahata, Manahata would have been more or less the same the very next day. You know, not, not fixed and unchanging, changing of course, but changing in a way that allowed all those plants and animals to continue to live there, including for people in a way that I don't think Manhattan has that same resilience anymore, right? It might have the resilience of its social <coughs> networks, but if you cut off the energy or you cut off the gas that goes into the city or you cut off the food or the water, then the whole thing will fall apart and those networks will work in a, in a way we don't want to see. Um, and in fact, you know, that's, that's really what I want for, for the city where I live now, which is to have it last, right? To have the same kind of sustainability and creative uh, forces that made Manahata work. And that's really what's driving my work uh, today. And so I just want to end, before I give over to Robin, um, and say a little bit about this work we're doing about Manahata 2409. So, so we did all this stuff about six, 400 years ago, 1609, and we have today. And then what's Manhattan going to look like 400 years from now? And nobody knows. But I think uh, one way we can help create a sustainable city is to think about cities as habitat for people, <coughs> constructed habitat for people, intentional, designed habitat for people, um, where habitat is food and water and shelter and reproductive resources. And arguably this, this fifth thing that in fact has been the focus of cities for 10,000 years, which is meaning. You know, cities are the places where religion was created and, and hierarchy, hierarchy was created and economies were created and trading was created. They all have, all those things happened in cities and, and even, you know, 10 years ago, that was the main thing we would talk about a city like New York is it's the cultural center and the financial center and the communication <laughs> center. It's all focused on how does it provide new and, and great meaning for people and it is fantastic about that. But what's so interesting about New York City today, and I suspect the same thing's happening out here, is that people are, trying, are seeing that they can find meaning in their food and where their food comes from, in their water, and understanding how their place fits into the water cycle. But the kind of buildings that they live in, you know, the kind of libraries that they build are reflections of the community and reflections of their values. And then we need places where we can raise our kids. And that somehow the, the, the joint solution to these different requirements is what will lead us to the great cities and the sustainability of the future. And so uh, at the end of my book, we, we tried to reflect that by taking some pictures of the city today. This is a Madison Square Park. And uh, just imagining a way that it could work a little better. Maybe not cars, but streetcars again, you know? Manhattan used to have um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of streetcars back when its population was two million people as opposed to 1.6 like it is today. What if we had streams again instead of storm drains to take our water away? What if Madison Square Park, instead of being planted in, La in London plane trees, was actually planted in mixed up Appalachian oak pine forest, which actually works for lots of species <laughs> while also being really beautiful? Um, and I'm not saying that we imagine a city without architecture or without density. I'm in fact s s suggesting that we need to build our cities so they work as well as, as ecosystems do.
And that means thinking about it at the scale of a block as well as to think of it at the scale of a neighborhood. Here's the Upper East Side. And here's the Upper East Side 400 years from now with green roofs on every building and streams winding through the, the, um, through the, the, the network of the city. And uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art expanded for whatever will come next. Um, and then we can even think about this beyond the boundaries of the city. And here is where I start to skate on, on thin ice. But um, although it might be a little bit hard to realize, there's 30 million people that live in the area of this satellite image. So something like one in 10 Americans live in the New York City metropolitan region, which when I first learned that, I was a little bit scared. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to, to realize that. That's, that's the end result of this kind of urbanization trend that we've been, we've been seeing. And people continue to move into the city. The, the city is predicted to go to 9 million people from, it's 8 million now, to go to 9 million people by, by 2030. And so in this sort of crazy quest to try and imagine what the city of the future looked like, we imagined, well, what if everybody lived at the density of Manhattan? And Manhattan has an extraordinary density, 65,000 people per square mile. And that's, in fact, the density that makes it, makes it such a special place, makes it a unique place in, in the United States. Um, but some of the people that you see in this image live at 1,000 people per square mile, right? And so what if we imagine everybody living at Manhattan density? Well, then they would only take up 36% of the area. And so even if the waters rise a meter or two with sea level rise, um, we could have what we used to have, which was farmland. And, and nature reserves, protecting our streams and our estuaries and our forests again. And a, a necklace of really beautiful, great, unique, uh, vibrant cities that are economically productive and fantastic places to live that have all the same kind of cultural amenities and communication, all the things we look to New York City today, but also be able to know the farmer who grows your food and be able to walk um, right out of your, you know, not have to go two hours away to go and visit nature, but actually be able to to just take a, take a streetcar out of town and see it for yourself. Um, so so this, is, this is the way I'm trying to think about the future. And this is no prediction. This, and I'm not saying this is what we're gonna do tomorrow. This isn't the recipe for tomorrow. And if it makes you feel any better, I wiped out my house too. Um, <laughs> um, but, I, but I think we need to really challenge ourselves to imagine how are, how are we gonna live today that enables people to live in the places we're living 400, 800, 1,200 years from now. Thank you very much. So uh, before we take questions, I thought, I thought um, Robin could speak for 10 or 15 minutes about the historical ecology of, uh, of Contra Costa, and then we'll take questions together. If you're a part of Well, thank you, Eric. And um, yeah, it's a real pleasure, obviously, to follow Eric um, and his wonderful project, which is very interesting. And yeah, as he mentioned, we're doing some similar work here in the Bay Area. And so we're going to just take a very quick little look, um, a taste of Contra Costa County, of a very different landscape of one you know and love um, you know, in, in an intimate way if you live here. And of course, it's a very different place um, climatically, right? Not instead of four inches of rain every month, six, six months with almost essentially no rain. Very different geology, very different history too. We're talking the equivalent to um, 1609 here is really 1769. So a lot more recently and really not that much happening in a lot of ways, especially out here, till the 1850s. So a much, um, you know, I think you see that reflected in the landscape, of course. So. Um, a little bit of a taste of Contra Costa County here shown in, um, in the Google Earth view. Here's the Walnut Creek area. We're right about here. And I'm going to start by talking just for a couple minutes about East Contra Costa County, right? Um, Antioch, Brentwood, those kinds of areas, because that's where we just are just completing a study called the East Contra Costa County Historical Ecology Study. So this is a slight pitch to look for this report if you're interested, which will be coming out next month. And I'll give you information about that in a second. And um, thanks some of the, all the groups which have been part of this. And actually Mitch Avalon, who's um, uh, the deputy director of Contra Costa's flood control, 
department is here today with his wife, Carolyn, and, and was a big um, proponent of developing this study because it actually has effect on how we might redesign our flood control channels over the next generation. So this, this, all, this stuff is actually very real and relevant in terms of how we redesign, as Eric's suggesting, our landscapes in the next generation. So East Contra Costa County, um, a very different landscape, a, a place with 10 to 12 inches of rain a year. Uh, this is our map of what it looked like in the early 1800s. We don't have the three-dimensional reconstruction yet. I, I uh, apologize. So you'll have to use your um, imagination a little bit more. But um, the green, of course, is the edge of the delta, the, the great Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, so the big Thule swamps, the marshes, the <coughs> tidal area this far inland. And the orange is, um, whoops, sorry. The orange is uh, oak savanna, so the Grand Valley oaks, the, these you know, beautiful trees that you also had in Walnut Creek. And then the whitish areas are the open grasslands, which of course were much more than grasslands, but wildflower meadows in the spring. They were really our, our, our seasonal color. We didn't really have the fall color so much uh, uh, of the temperate deciduous forest, but we had these spring wildflower meadows. And then as you get up into the hills of Mount Diablo there, you see the red areas which are actually woodlands, the blue oak woodlands, quite a bit of which is left on Mount, Mount Diablo. But you can see a very open landscape in a, a place um, uh, of relatively few trees in most places, but um, kind of grand vistas and really a landscape well adapted to a very dry climate. In fact, we who are studying anticipating climate change in other parts of the Bay Area think this may be really useful for us to understand because this is a system very well adapted to relatively low rainfall. So it might be, and yet it's ecologically functional. It was a rich, beautiful, um, you know, biodiverse landscape, something we can learn from. And I thought I would show our favorite map of the area, which is, is a wonderful map that, that kind of kept us going, made by a guy, a surveyor named Witcher in 1853. And it has an interesting combination of technical accuracy and kind of um, almost childlike uh, sketchiness. And it shows, I can get the mouse working here. Um, these are over here the oaks, those valley oak savanna. And over here is a great brushland and a bunch of different fascinating places. And we can actually zoom into those. This map, too, similar to what Eric showed, we we're able to geo reference it, it, believe it or not, is actually quite accurate. So we're actually able to lay it into the computer and identify these features on the ground. And so this feature I've circled there. Uh, is um, one of our favorite things of East Contra Costa County, which was a massive chemisal or dense brushland, which uh, was um, associated with these uh, kind of unusual geology of sands, Pleistocene sands brought from the Sacramento San Joaquin River complex over thousands of years and depositing this um, huge body of unusual soils. That's what Antioch Dunes is part of, is still a tiny remnant of that today. But was this massive area is essentially all much of Antioch and, um, and, and, and Brentwood as well, and had really interesting characteristics. It was very dense and, uh, and a, a place where uh, grizzly bears would hide and lots of wildlife, and it's full of uh, silvery bush lupin and legs, legless lizards. And there actually are small remnants left today, believe it or not. This is how big of a deal it was. Is it, it was, I think this, this is several hundred thousand acres in size, and was shown as an individual feature on all of these historical maps. So a really amazing feature, somewhat long forgotten, but of course all those sandy soils are there underneath people's houses and in, in people's backyards. And there are still some sandy hills left, and there's, there's a reason to think about whether we might want to preserve and even connect up some of the little pieces that are left. And I think that's the story of this part of the world, is that we still have some of those choices to make. You know, we haven't gone all the way as far as New York City has. We're still making some of those decisions today. Here's another one, the salt pond up there in the corner. A really silly little diagram, you would think, but it actually is a pretty good picture that sh of that lake that shows up in 1942 and is actually still somewhat intact in many little pieces today. It's the Byron Hot Springs area which actually still has a number of endangered and threatened species and could actually still be restored 
if people actually really wanted to, and the landowners wanted to. Um, this is um, the great oak savanna, the Roblar of um, East Contra Costa County. It's a really wonderful environment of these beautiful, um, great oak trees in a park-like landscape and, um, and well adapted to the dry conditions, reaching down deep to groundwater. Really the only tree that can make itself survive the long hot summer out there in the hot open plain. The settlers really gravitated to these areas because of the shade they provided. And many of those trees, well I don't know about many, but a few of those trees are actually still out there. Now, this is just not even stopping in the car as you can see. Not very safe. And, uh, but scattered out there, and um, I think maybe someone else was driving. And the, um, and this is, we found this around much of the Bay Area that this pattern has happened, that these beautiful shade trees that were known and loved were lost 100 years ago, but actually now people might want to have them back in our neighborhoods because they're, they're well adapted for our environments. And so the idea of reoaking has sort of come to the fore. So what about Walnut Creek, where we are now? We haven't studied that area yet, but we actually would like to, and there's some interest in moving the study into this area next because there are lots of questions about redesigning the flood control channels, um, how to deal with stream flows, uh, again, urban forestry and what sort of trees would make sense to plant. As Eric mentioned, you know, in the East Coast, we've done the same thing here, is planted a somewhat bizarre array of trees. And some of them might, um, it might make sense to supplement that with some of our native trees and provide a lot of habitat for birds and other native species. But, um, what do we know? So we haven't actually studied the Walnut Creek Valley yet, but a few things we can see from early maps, um, you can see this better than I can from this angle, but this is, I think, Walnut Creek here, and you can see this word roblar here, which means uh, valley oak grove or white oak grove, which is an indication, as we know from other documents, that your valley too, like Napa Valley and Santa Clara Valley, was one of these beautiful oak savannas classic California habitat that's much lost. This is Aguaje, these are springs, the river, the Arroyo, uh, Caseca, uh, which dries out, Saseca, um, de las nueces, that's the walnuts, right? And um, there's it up there. And then this one is really a wonderful map as well. And it captures the fact that Walnut Creek actually is, is a much wetter system than the east part of the Contra Costa County. Has all these tulars, a tulare, a, a um, freshwater swamp, and these little lakes or lagunas. Um, at least one of which, I think this one, is part of, and I'm forgetting the name of the, the park. So this is, is, um, is Farms. Heather Farms, exactly, good job, <laughs> thank you. Um, is actually still there. So pieces of this puzzle are still intact. And of course, as you know, beavers have recently come back to neighboring streams. This is not all that far away in some sense. Many of the pieces are still there, even though it's so heavily modified. This, I think, is the Sossel, or the, the Monte del Diablo, which, as you may know, was the willow thicket that actually was the name Mount Diablo. That was just an accident that it was transferred to the mountain, because Mont, Monte actually means thicket, and, and, and so that was sort of an accident of history. But that was a really major feature, and who knows, as the flood control channel is redesigned down there and the tidal marsh component is redesigned, perhaps that will look, thicket could come back or be a relevant feature to consider. So all of this remains to be discovered and thought through, and, um, and if you're interested, um, the fourth quadrennial big word, Contra Costa County Creek and Watershed Symposium is actually being held next month on November 17th. And that's where we're gonna unveil this, um, this study that we've just completed on East Contra Costa County and um, hopefully build momentum for looking at Walnut Creek. And um, if you're interested, feel free to look at that website or contact me. So thanks very much and let's get back to the show. <laughs> So I understand we're taking questions by card. So if you have, raise the screen. okay, all right. Um, Chris is going to raise the screen. Raise the screen if you have questions for Robin. Write it on a card and pass it forward. Um, in the meantime, I'll uh, handle these. Okay, so 
Uh, thoughts on next steps for the MirWet application, ex uh, exploring and operationalizing the process to map other ecosystems. So the question is about, about can we use the MirWebs to, for other places, and absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, why Rob and I are colleagues is because we're trying to figure out how we can connect, you know, the kind of work we're great things he's doing here with other possibilities for historical ecology um, across the country and indeed I think across the world eventually. Um, I think there's a huge amount of potential in the mirror web concept that we've just, just barely, barely touched. Um, and in fact, uh, I mentioned the Wailikia project, we're doing the rest of New York City and we have, we have in our mind's eye a project, uh, project about Jerusalem actually, um, but not 400 years ago, 4,000 years ago. So if you're interested in about that, I'll tell you more about that too. Okay, so and then there's another question here. What year did you graduate from Los Alamos? Feeling uh, <laughs> <laughs> like maybe I should keep that secret. But, uh, 1985, so that was a little while ago. Um, and was the bark Earth abides an influence? And and yeah, you know, when I was in high school, I went through my apocalyptic stage <laughs> and read read various versions of apocalypse. But uh, Earth abides was an important part of it, you know. Um, but I'm not, I'm not all about imagining the world without people or with many fewer people. I'm actually trying to find a way for, uh, for all of us to be here and for nature to be here too. Um, you, might, you might know the book uh, um, uh, The World Before People um, by Alan Wiseman. And he interviewed me when he was doing his New York chapter and it's a really, really great book. And I, when he first, he, he, his book is premised on the idea, well, what if everybody just disappeared, all the people just disappeared, what would happen to the places we live? And uh, like he imagines, he has this great bit about, about New York City where um, he notes that the subways are constantly pumping water out of the subways. And if, if they stopped within 24 hours, the subway tunnels would just fill with water. And eventually that would rust out the supports and then the subway tunnels would collapse. And then he has this image of you know, the, the, men, the skyscrapers in Manhattan like trees. Yeah. Falling, boom, 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 boom. Anyway, so but when Alan first contacted me, I was like, I don't know if I want to talk to you because you know that's not what we're trying to do is imagine the world without people. And he, you know, he eventually convinced me that uh, that that was an interesting question because it helps us sort of see our relationship to to the landscape. But but I think the real challenge for us, in fact, the challenge for the 21st century is, and it's gonna it's gotta kind of get solved in our lifetimes is is how are we going to live with so many people, so many large body primates on the planet. And I think, uh, I think the only way it'll work is if we use our particular talent, which has made us so successful. And what is that? But that's to talk to each other, to communicate, to imagine the past and imagine futures and to share ideas about that. And uh, that's really the kind of you know, vein that I think both Robin and I are working in. All right, um, so what does it say? What has this project's visuals and knowledge change New Yorkers' perspective on nature and thus connectivity to nature in an extreme urban environment. Um, we could be more extreme. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's changed a lot. People really love the pictures. I mean, that's been a very important part of our project. Um, but in some ways, if you look at them, they're just green. They're, as one landscape architect said to me, oh, they're just broccoli, right? <laughs> so if you fly above, a, fly above a deciduous forest, it looks a lot like broccoli. Um, but I think what people appreciate is that there's so much work underneath it. They appreciate that it's not just broccoli, it's not just made up, but it actually is, is true to the science as best we can understand it. Um, and I think this idea of premising it on the moment of Henry Hudson, of sort of imagining what New York was like just a few hours before Henry Hudson sails into the harbor, has been very important. Um, because people have been imagining that moment for a long time and not really knowing what came before. And you can read these you know, big old history books of New York and they all start with Henry Hudson and they say like you know, a word or two. Or, uh, it, it usually goes like this, it usually goes, there was a glacier and then there was Lenape and then there was Henry Hudson and then the Dutch did this and the Dutch did that and the Dutch did this and it goes on like that. Um, so, so, and I don't blame the historians, it's because history doesn't, you know, the his, historians work from the written record and there just aren't that, there just aren't written records. You have to use other ways of understanding um, but there are ecological histories, right? There are records that we can go back that way. So, um, and I think, uh, I think we've been successful in, in adding a new element to the idea of New York, and that's this idea of Manahata. Um, discuss, I think this one's for you, Robin. Uh, discuss, okay. 
Yeah, that one's good for you. <laughs> Maybe this is good for you, actually. <laughs> 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 I'm an urban planner. Discuss local height restrictions, i.e. 35 feet or 50 feet, and its effect on surrounding habitat. Are we making a mistake in building out rather than building up? Hmm. That's something you can Yes. <laughs> Should I take this one? Tell us more about the Byron Hot Springs. Exclamation mark. I like that. Um, well, yeah, that's a fascinating area, and um, it's is kind of part of a larger complex, which I guess I didn't point out on that map, which is that there was the tidal marsh, you know, merging into the delta, is the kind of broad alluvial plain, moving, merging into the delta, but between the oaks and grasslands and the wetlands of the delta, there was a broad swath of alkali meadows, of these uh, areas where salts evaporated um, each year and sort of built a, a salty, um, alkaline, you know, almost like um, like a um, playa in the desert kind of environment, and and that's because it's because the the high amount of uh, evaporation in the summer and yet a fair amount of rain in the winter. So you got this really unusual set of plant species and then animals adapted to that in these fairly unique environments. And it was um, this is something you didn't really find that much in the rest of the Bay Area. A fairly unique aspect of East Contra Costa County, probably associated with the climate. And it had a lot of seasonal wetlands or playas that filled with water and became these seasonal ponds in the winter and had a lot of characteristics of vernal pools and supported a lot of vernal pool plants and animals like tadpole shrimp and fairy shrimp and uh, tiger salamander. In fact, all of those species, I think, are still found in the area as well as a number of rare plants in little remnants. And of course, that characteristic of the soils doesn't go away that easily, right? It's fairly impregnated in the soil. And the climate hasn't changed, so there actually is a lot of potential to recover, preserve the pieces that are there, and even you know, recover some more of those elements. And Byron Hot Springs is kind of, in a way, was the epicenter, because there was also a spring there, which made this big complex of wetlands that included really perennial components and was a real, um, real kind of focal spot, probably, for that whole ecosystem. It's an interesting area, and of course, because of the hot springs, it still has been somewhat preserved for that function. We should probably close up. I know Kristen has one more word, but I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I came to the Wana Creek Library when I was a kid, and I spent a lot of time here, and I, I think I wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for the library. So, so thank you very much for your support of the library. And Kristen. Well, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Robin. That was fascinating and very fun. And I'm going to put their websites on my website. So if you want more information about this, um, our, the Library Foundation's website is wclibrary.org. This is being filmed by Walnut Creek TV, so it will be on their channels, and you can check that with your local provider um, in the future. And they also share their content with Contra Costa TV, so we're very lucky um, not only to have wonderful open spaces in Contra Costa County, but two public access TV stations. So all of our Life in the Library programs are on the station for you to see again and again and share with your friends. Um, and if you are watching this on TV, please visit our website. And like Marianne said at the beginning, um, this is made possible by people becoming supporters of the Library Foundation. So I want to thank everybody who is a supporter. And if you're watching on, on TV, go to our website, wclibrary.org, and feel free to make a donation. And finally, um, Eric's book is available for sale. If you brought a book, which I know one person did, um, he will sign your books out in the lobby. Uh, Angie with Real Books is out there. She has a few copies you can take home today, or you can um, order through her, and she will mail it to you. But she does have book plates, so Eric can sign the book plate, so you will still have something signed for a gift or for yourself. So thank you so much for coming to our beautiful library. We really appreciate it, and have a wonderful night.